so you know, that's a, you know, my Leonid McGill character. I, I started writing it. I, I'm, I'm thinking I have to publish it as a novella now, but you know, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But it's fun to think. I'm glad you, you seem to like it. I, I get, I've gotten funnier as I've gotten older. I don't know why. <laughs> I guess, you know, you realize, you know, you don't have that, uh, you don't have that much time. You know, this, uh, this I, well, it's true, right? I mean, honestly, you know, it's like, do you want it? And you have to actually think about it. And just say, well, you know, the, this, this is the whiskey that you got. Okay. But, um, you know, the, 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 the idea, like, you know, as you get older, you, you have to get, you know, more serious. It's so interesting. You look, you look at somebody like, like Louis Armstrong, you know. Um, Louis, Louis Armstrong, uh, when he was a young man, played, played trumpet faster than anybody ever played trumpet. And, and also he played beautifully. He, he did all these amazing things. But you know, when he got older, you know, he was older, his fingers had a little arthritis, his lip was damaged because he was playing all the time. You know, so he would play like, you know, like a tenth the amount of notes. But he still went through the same gyration because, you know, he knew where the notes were. He didn't have to, you know, count to get there, you know. Uh, and, and, I, and I say that not because I'm complaining, uh, comparing myself to Ms., Mr. Armstrong, pops. <laughs> what, 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 what I'm, what I'm, what I'm gonna, what I'm doing is because my main character in this book is is Joe King Oliver. Now Joe King Oliver, the original, taught Louis Armstrong how to play, you know, Trump, and and a lot of other things I think that they don't talk about. Uh, <laughs> And so I, I need to say that to you because the, 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 I'm going to read you just a little bit of the beginning of this one, and and and, and that should be you know fun. But 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 the, but the the idea is is that nothing in in the beginning tells you what this story is about. You know, I, you know there there are people you know all over the country, black men, you know, who either get into fight with the police and you know something happens or or or, or the police kind of kill them you know for reasons which you know are never quite clear well I was on his chest and I was putting a gun at his head and and, and he kept screaming so I, I had to shoot him you know it's like, it's like you know I mean you were on his chest with a gun at his head he didn't have no gun and you would you would think like you know I mean it's, it's I think that one moment where you know you you have to kind of little, think a little bit about the NRA. Say, God, I wish that motherfucker had a gun, you know? So he could protect himself, you know? And, and, you know, a lot of times people commit crimes. White people, black people, you know, it doesn't matter. But sometimes it's a crime of self-defense. You know, and, and really, that's, I mean exactly that, a crime of self-defense. My main character gets involved in a case. He's a black man, he's a, a cop, so therefore he doesn't like people who kill cops. But he gets involved in a case where somebody says that this man who's been sentenced to death might have been defending himself. And, and I wrote, and I wanted to write the story because I just wanted to say, well, what if you find out that a guy is innocent of a crime and he's going to you know, have a terrible punishment for that crime? Are you, like most of us probably think, going to do nothing? Or just fight and fight and fight until they finally execute him? Or might you step outside the box? That, that was the whole, the whole thing, the whole reason I wrote this novel. None of that is in what I'm going to read to you. So. <laughs> but I'm going to introduce Joe King Oliver. So, so it's a couple pages, and you know, and you know, hopefully you'll still want to buy the book. <laughs> Looking out from my second floor window onto Montague Street is better than the third floor view. From here, you can almost make out the lines and the faces of the hundreds of working people moving past. People who, more and more, have no reason to walk through the doors of the fancy shops and banks that have made their claim on that thoroughfare. These new businesses are like modern-day prospectors, panning for gentrified golden customers who will buy the million-dollar condos and fancy clothes, eat in the French bistros, and buy wine for $100 a bottle. When I took this office, almost 11 years ago now, there were used bookstores, secondhand clothes shops, and enough fast food to feed that displaced army of workers at Brooklyn Heights. That's when Christoph Hale offered me a 20-year renewable lease because another cop, Gladstone Palmer, had overlooked his son, Leif Hale's involvement in the brutal attack on a woman, a woman whose only offense was to say no. Three years later, Leif went to prison for another beating, one that got bargained down to manslaughter. But this had nothing to do with me. I had the lease by then. My maternal grandmother always tells me that every man gets what he deserves. Thirteen years earlier, I was a cop too. I would have tried to put Leif in prison for that first assault, but that's just me. 
not everyone sees the rules the same. The, the law is a flexible thing on both sides of the line, influenced by circumstance, character, and of course, wealth, or lack of same. My particular problem with women was, at one time, my desire for them. It didn't take but a smile and a wink for me, Detective First Class Joe King Oliver, to walk away from my duties and promises, vows and common sense for something, or just a promise of something that was as transient as a stiff breeze, a good beer, or a street that couldn't maintain its population. For the last 13 years, I've been somewhat less influenced by my sexual dramas. I still appreciate the opposite, sometimes known as the fairer sex, but the last time I acted on instinct, I ran into so much trouble that I believed that I was pretty much cured of my roaming ways. Her name was Nathalie Malcolm. She was a modern-day Tulula Bankhead, with a husky voice, quick wit, and that certain something that defined the long-ago starling. My dispatcher, the same Sergeant Gladstone Palmer, called via cell phone to give me the assignment. It should be easy, Joe Palmer assured me. It's basically a favor for the chief of these. But I'm on that port side thing glad. Little Exeter always makes his move on Wednesdays. That means he'll be doing it next Wednesday and the one after that, my sergeant reads. Gladstone and I had come through the academy together. He was white Irish and I was a deep shade of brown, but that never affected our friendship. I'm close, glad, I said, real close. That may very well be, but, but minutes in a hospital bed with a, a punctured lung and, and, and Brewster messes up two out of every five collars. You need a point or two on your sheet this year anyway. You spend so much time at the docks, you don't make half the arrests you need to keep your numbers up to snuff. He was right. The one place the law was not flexible was in statistics. Criminal arrests and convictions, the retrieval of stolen property, and competent investigation that leads to crime solution were what our professional careers hinged upon. I had a big case in front of me, but it might be a year or more before I could wrap it up. What's the offense? I said. GTA? Just one cop for a chop shop? Nathalie Malcolm stole the bins from Tremont Bendix of the Upper East Side. A woman car thief? Order came from up top. I guess Ben has got friends. It's just a single woman lives alone in Park Slope. They say the car is parked in front of the bomb, so all you have to do is ring the bell and slap on some cuffs. You got paper on her. Better be waiting for you at the station, and okay? What? Not only use my middle name when you wanted to make a point. Don't mess it up. I'll send you a text with all the details. The purple Ben was in front of her place. It had the right plates. I, I looked at the front door flanked by full-length windows that were swathed in yellow curtains. I remember thinking that this was the easiest arrest I'd ever been sent on. Yes, she said, opening the door maybe a minute after I, I ran. Her tan eyes seemed to be staring through a fog at me. She had red hair and the rest pure to lose. My grandmother likes old movies. When I, when I visit her in the lower Manhattan retirement home, we watch old love stories and comedies on TCM. Miss Malcolm, I said. Yes, I'm Detective Oliver. I have a warrant for your arrest. <coughs> you what? I took out the leather fold with my shield and ID. These I showed her. She looked, but I'm not sure she registered anything. Uh, Tremont Bendix claims you stole his car. Oh, she sighed, shook her head slightly. Come in, Detective. Come in. I could have grabbed her right there, put on the restraints about reciting her rights as the Supreme Court detailed them, but this was a soft arrest and the lady was feeling tender. Well, anyway, little Exeter Barrett had already connected with the captain of the Sea Frog. The shipment of heroin wouldn't be in for a few more days. I was a good cop, the kind of officer who had yards of patience and lost his temper only when threatened physically by some suspect. And even then, I took no joy in beating him after he'd been subdued and Restraint. <laughs> Would you like some water? Nathalie Malcolm asked. The good stuff's all been packed away. The living room was filled with boxes, bulging duffel bags, and piles of books and electronic equipment, along with clusters of potted plants. What's going on here? I asked, as if reciting a line that had been written for me. This is what Tree calls me stealing his car. She was wearing a sheer and shimmery green house coat with nothing underneath. I, I hadn't paid close attention at first. When I got there, I was still intent on the job. I don't understand, I said. For the past three years, he's paid my rent and left me the bins to use as my car, she said. Her tan eyes turned golden under electric light. 
Then his wife threatened to divorce him, and he told me to get out and bring his car back to his uptown garage. I see. I have to move, detective. What's your name again? Joe. When Natalie smiled and shifted her shoulders, the structure of our temporary relationship changed from potential handcuffs to definite bed sheets. <laughs> Natalie was very good in bed. She knew how to kiss, and that is the most important thing to me. I need to be kissed and kissed a lot. She intuited this necessity, and we spent the better part of that afternoon and way into the evening discovering new and exciting ways and places to kiss. She was a victim. I could see that in her eyes, hear it in her deep voice. And the arrest warrant was wrong. A man leaving his car at a girlfriend's house, a house he paid the rent on, had no expectation of her returning that automobile to his garage. The next morning, I'd make my report and, and, and get to the docks where the real crime was happening. When I opened my, mind, my eyes, Monica Lars, my wife at that time, was already awake and making breakfast for her and Asia Denise, our six-year-old daughter. I awoke to the smell of coffee and the memory of Natalie kissing my spine in a place I could not reach. I left her when my shift was over. I had showered and changed at the station and got home in time for late supper. Drowsing for the last time in my morning bed, I took in a deep, satisfied breath. Then the doorbell rang. The bedroom of our queen's home was on the second floor, and, and, and I wasn't doing to work until the afternoon. I was naked and very tired, and anyway, Monica knew how to answer a door. Uh. <coughs> I stretched a bit, thinking how much I loved my little family and that a promotion to captain was not an impossibility once I single-handedly busted the largest heroin ring ever to exist within the borders of the greatest city on earth. Joe, Monica yelled from the entrance hall which was downstairs and all the way to the front of the house. What, I bellowed, it's the police. <laughs> the one thing a, a cop's wife never says is, it's the police. That's what criminals and the victims of criminals say. So, sometimes we said it about ourselves while pointing a service revolver at the back of some perp's head. The mayor called us the police, and now and then the newspapers did, but a cop's wife saying, it's the police, would be like my black-skinned grandmother calling out to my ex-sharecropper grandfather that it's some Negroes at the door. <laughs> something wrong and that Monica was trying to warn me. I had no idea that that would be her last loving act in our marriage or that her, her call heralded the end of any kind of normal life that I could expect.